Good morning, Ringway Church. I am pleased to be with you. Although, as I checked during last week, your Ringway Life Building is closed. I know that the church that usually gathered for worship inside is alive and well. Together with my daughters, I had an opportunity to join your children's Sabbath school last week. And today, not only Sabbath school, but an opportunity to share God's word with you. I would like to thank Pastor Julian Castrati, who reached out to me several months ago via Facebook and invited me to preach, making sure I won't become rotten out. Thank God for Facebook. Your pastor also asked me to preach on the theme of supernatural, which is really challenging yet important topic. Your pastor also asked me to link the sermon to Halloween, which falls today. And I need to admit, I am not an expert on Halloween, as I also come from the country where we do not have, or at least when I was young, we hadn't got any tradition of celebrating Halloween. Therefore, I needed to rely on the ultimate source of knowledge, which is Wikipedia, of course. There, I was able to read about the etymology of the word, different suggestions of history of its celebration, as well as how it is celebrated nowadays. I read about different activities that people are engaged in celebrating this time, such as trick or treating, and attending Halloween costume parties, craving pumpkins. Actually, those first three I knew about from the movies, but there is more. There are activities that include lightning bonfires, apple bobbing, divination games, playing pranks, visiting haunted attractions, telling scary stories, as well as watching horror movies. Well, what is really strange, the author or authors of this Wikipedia entry seem to see Halloween as a part of a whole spectrum of activities people do during All Hallows Eve which is part of a three days of celebration in the tradition of Western Christianity. And those days are All Hallows Eve, or All Saints Eve, All Saints Day, and All Souls Day. And this is the tradition within which I was raised and accustomed to practice. I remember that in my Catholic family, those three days were spent visiting the graves of the dead and lighting the candles. Yet, although Halloween falls during non-biblical but Christian festival season, its roots are probably pagan, rooted in the Celtic traditions. In my eyes, Halloween is simply playing games that celebrates death, horror, and all powers of darkness. And the biggest problem I have with this is that according to my worldview, which I believe it's based on the Bible, so I dare to say according to biblical worldview, the spiritual realm of the powers of darkness is real and alive. So as we celebrate today, not Halloween, but the day of remembrance of wonderful creation of our Creator and Redeemer, who asked us to observe it, the Holy Sabbath day, I would like to concentrate with you on our oh, sorry, on one particular instance of confrontation between those two realms, the realm of God, 
and the realm of the power of darkness, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of devil. If you are okay with that, I invite you to open your Bible on the Gospel of Luke. If you are not okay, you can always switch to different sermon, but I think this topic is uh, really worth pondering. So, if you are staying with me, open your Bible on the Gospel of Luke. If you want to follow the text that I will concentrate today, it's Gospel of Luke, chapter 11. Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, and I will be reading from verse 14. I will start our reading from verse 14. It is English Standard Version. Now he was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. So, straight from the beginning, we are thrown by the narrator in the middle of an action. Jesus is casting the demon out of a person who is mute. Suddenly, after the demon had gone out, the person spoke. The crowd was amazed. It was made clear who was responsible for the inability to speak. The evangelist Luke shares with us two of probably more reactions. Let us continue our reading now verse 15. But some of them said, He casts out the demons by the Beelzebub, the prince of demons. So the first reaction is an accusation. They were accusing Jesus of casting the demon by the power of Beelzebub. This term is not widely used today by Christians. Yet it is qualified by the evangelist with a phrase or a title, the Prince of Demons. And interestingly enough, in ancient Semitic texts, the name Baal is used with a title Prince, very similar in wording as the second bit of the name here in the Gospel of Luke. Therefore, the name means Baal the prince or Baal the ruler. And as one scholar explains, Baal was ruler of the gods, the earth and the underworld. Having established who Beelzebub was, let us paraphrase the accusation. This Jesus is casting out the demon by the power of the ruler of demons. Do not be deceived. He is not the agent of heaven, but of darkness. This is what this group meant. Let us read verse 16, which gives us yet another accusation. Verse 16. Why others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. So, this is the second, not accusation, but reaction. And this reaction, the people are requiring Jesus to produce a sign. Actually, Jesus has just done one. Nevertheless, it is a quite frequent theme in the Gospels that people require Jesus to produce a sign straight after one has just been made. Jesus replies to that later um, on speaking on the sign of Jonah in the section we won't cover today. We will focus today our reading and reflection uh, on the passage that Jesus replies to this first reaction, which is his accusation. Let us read Jesus' response. Verse 17. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, 
and the divided household falls. Jesus shares with them a common knowledge. Divided kingdoms are doomed to be destroyed. So Jesus is laying the foundation of his argument which comes in the next verse. So verse 18 and the verse 19. And Jesus continues, if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. Here we see Jesus, who uses the common knowledge from the previous verse in order to apply it to the accusation. He tries to show that it would be illogical if the demonized person by the kingdom of darkness would be made free by the same kingdom. What would be the reason behind it? Does the kingdom of darkness is divided? For Jesus, it certainly isn't. Moreover, in this passage, Jesus equals Beelzebul with Satan. And Jesus indicates that he is not fighting against his own kingdom. Jesus also asked his accusers by which power they, their sons casted out the demons. If they would have said by the power of God, it would reinforce the argument of Jesus, since God is fighting against Satan, not Satan against Satan. If they would have said demons, they would condemn their own people. Therefore, it was difficult for them to respond. Nevertheless, it seems it is only a rhetorical question, for Jesus continues to present his main argument. Verse 20. But if it is the sorry, but if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus presents to his interlocutors the meaning of the action they witnessed. He says that it is God who empowers Jesus to drive the demons out. It was believed at that time that with the coming of the Messiah, God will establish his kingdom. Jesus started his mission with proclamation that God's kingdom is being established. The time is near. God's kingdom is at hand. The implication is simple, yet profound. Jesus is the Messiah. The proof of the pudding is in the eating as they say, and the proof of Jesus being God's messianic agent is in his activity of casting out the demons. At least this is one of the proofs. For us, this statement may raise a question. What preconditioned the Jews to expect from the Messiah the power of demons? the power over the demons. We don't have anything of that sort in the Old Testament. Yes, that's true. We don't have anything like in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, concerning casting out the demons. Yet we can find some information in the intertestamental Jewish literature about it. 
From there, we can learn that the Jews were expecting from the Messiah to have power above the demons. Some of those texts you can find in the English translation of the Septuagint. In the Psalm 51, the version of the Psalm 51 you can find in Septuagint. You can also find it in the collection of Psalms found in the 11th cave at Qumran. So, in verse 20, we can find two kingdoms. There are two kingdoms on the earth fighting against each other. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. The kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. From this picture comes the title of this sermon, Two Kingdoms. Friends, today we have two fists. fists. Two fists have met. The Holy Sabbath and Halloween. This is to remind us that there are still two powers, two kingdoms, fighting against each other for this planet. For you and for me. For your household and for mine as well. We are on the battlefield. Yet because this war involves the spiritual realm, it is not as visible as other wars, that we can watch on TV. However, we can still see, I believe, the outcome of some of the battles of this supernatural war in the news as well. What is important for you and for me, it is the fact that we can see the battles of those two kingdoms in our own lives. This is part of our supernatural worldview we studied about during last week's Sabbath school lesson. Let's read further to see what Jesus wants us to teach, what he wants to teach his listeners and by extension us about those two kingdoms at war. So let us read verse 21 and 22. Jesus continues his response. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides, he divides his spoil. Jesus shares a short parable or a simile. Jesus compares the demon with a strong man guarding his own castle. And he compares himself with a stronger man who can overpower the strong man in the castle. What is the lesson? What is the lesson? Jesus is more powerful than the kingdom of darkness. Jesus is more powerful than the kingdom of darkness. He is the champion. Let me use more modern comparison. I don't like boxing, but it fits pretty well here. Let's imagine a boxer who is the best in his category. He wins every fight. He always defends his title till the very retirement. Jesus is like this boxer, with one small difference. He doesn't have any plans for retiring. At least, not until the kingdom of Satan is still in operation. 
And this is great news for us. This is the news that we need to constantly be reminded of. When we ally with Jesus, we ally not only with the world's champion, he is the champion of all the universe. We need to always remember this. The three friends of Daniel in the Valley of Dura, they remembered it. They believed that their God is always more powerful, more powerful than the fire. No matter what problems you face, Jesus is more powerful. When Satan is causing a spiritual problem in your life, Jesus is more powerful. When Satan is causing a problem in a relationship, Jesus is more powerful. When Satan is causing a financial problem in your life, Jesus is more powerful. Let me tell you, I was involved in activities which now I consider of devil. But at that point in my life, I wasn't sure and I wanted to practice them. And there were certain activities that you may call magic, spiritualism, extrasensory perception, tarot card, hypnosis, and I can go on and on. But when the time came that I wanted to be set free from those activities, I turned to Jesus. There was a point in my life that I felt completely enslaved to the kingdom of darkness. And then I called upon the name of Jesus and I asked him to protect me from the kingdom of darkness. And he did so. Why? Why he was able to do this? Because Jesus is more powerful than the kingdom of darkness. And Jesus is only waiting for you to come to him and ask and ask for the protection and ask for his power to save you. This is the lesson number one. Jesus is more powerful than the kingdom of darkness. Now let us continue our reading, verse 23. Whoever is not with me, Jesus says, is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. Jesus gives yet another very important lesson. He speaks of his own allies. He says that either we are involved in the expansion of the kingdom or we scatter. Therefore, we learn the next lesson that says we cannot be neutral in this war. We cannot be neutral. Either we are allies of Jesus or we are or will be the captives of Satan. During the Second World War, Switzerland declared neutrality and the country was not involved in the global conflict. We do not possess that kind of luxury in this war, in this supernatural war. If we are not with Jesus, sooner or later, we will belong to Satan. Therefore, the decision, I and my house will serve the Lord, is not an option. It is a necessity for a Christian home. Moreover, let us ask the question, what if a church is not involved somehow in God's mission of expanding his kingdom? Is this church a Christian church? I think the answer is obvious according to this text. The text this text is a call to be involved. Those words of Jesus are, call, are a call to be involved. 
to be involved in a meaningful relationship with Jesus on the personal level. To always say to Jesus, Here I am, Lord, as we were able to hear last week during the sermon of Pastor Castrati. To cultivate the good Christian practices of family worship in a Christian homes on the familiar, on the level of family, when couples and children can grow in Christ together. And it is also a call to be involved in some way with the mission of the church. Every one of us can find his or her place in that great task, for there are plenty of opportunities to get involved. If you say that now is the time of global pandemic, now we cannot do things we were doing before, I would say, yes, that is true, but what if that pandemic never ends? I hope it will very soon, don't get me wrong, but whenever it will end or would not end, learning what we can do in these circumstances will definitely profit operation of our church for the future. Some companies decided that some of their staff won't need to come back to the office and can work from home indefinitely. This pandemic will change the world, and that's for sure. The question is open, how it will change our church, how it will change our ways of doing mission. I strongly believe that this obstacle in the form of pandemic, this obstacle on our way must be transformed into a benefit. And of course, let motivation for doing this will be the good of the others who are lost without Christ. So this is the lesson that comes from those words of Jesus. We cannot be neutral. Let us continue our study. And now we will read verses from 24 to 26. Jesus says, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places, seeking rest. And finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more e evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. Another metaphorical story comes from Jesus. Let me just highlight the main point of this parable by asking you a question. Why did the spirit get into the house the second time? Why? Some can point to spirits not finding their restful place. However, this was the reason for the idea to return, not the reason why he was able to enter it back. Some can say because the house was put in order. But isn't it true that it always needs to be put in order? So what is the reason? The house was empty. Let me interpret Jesus' words. Jesus says that when he drives out the demon, it goes away to others. 
who are part of the kingdom of God. He cannot find in them the place of rest for himself. Therefore, he decides to return to the person from whom he has been casted away. When he finds, what he finds is that this person didn't make lasting alliance with the kingdom of God and the demon has an easy access to him or her. What is the lesson from that story? We are not secure from Satan if we are not constantly submitted to the kingdom of God. We are not secure from Satan if we are not constantly submitted to the kingdom of God. And let me be clear. When I speak of kingdom of God, I mean everywhere God rules. For where God rules, there is God's kingdom. And this is this fight we need to fight with ourselves to be constantly surrendered to God. Because we are not secured from Satan if we are not constantly surrendered to the kingdom of God. Do you have sometimes difficulty when it is hard for you to surrender to God? Are, you, are there in your lives events when it is difficult for you to live a Christian lifestyle? If yes, it means that you have experienced the moments when you need being surrendered to Jesus the most. And let me be even more clear with you. Too often, a typical Christian thinks of demonic oppression. He or she thinks about being involved in magic. I, I used to be in some kind of satanic practices or listening to heavy metal music. I presume if we think at all about a category of being oppressed with demonic forces, we tend to think along those lines. And although it is more and more common even in our secular society, to find people interested in magic or satanism? Actually, I personally think those are not the most typical ways in which demonic forces are trying to oppress people. Let me briefly share with you other circumstances other story from my own life when I was experiencing a demonic oppression. It was a time when my wife was my girlfriend. So it was before our marriage, at the initial stage of our relationship. And at that time, I started to have a very critical thoughts about her. Those, those thoughts were harassing me. I didn't tell her about it. Nevertheless, they resulted in how I treated her. I thought that those thoughts are generated by my mind. So I tried to subdue them. However, what is in mind influences the life. And as a result, we started to argue very easily and our relationship wasn't great. But as I thought there were my words and my thoughts, I thought that I just need to get rid of them, but it proved not to be that easy. 
to cut the long story short, when I was tried, uh, sorry, when I was tired of them, I finally asked Carolina to pray about it. And something terrible happened. This was during the youth gathering in the church. We went uh, to a separate uh, place in, in the church. And when Karina was praying, I started crying. And I couldn't help myself. This initial cry became a real hysteria. After a while, I was totally paralyzed, not able to move nor control my body. Uh, in the meantime, some people came, they surrounded me and prayed for me, but nothing seemed to help. And it took some time, I'm just sharing it quickly. At one point, I started to feel a pain, as if a chain was around my chest, producing difficulty to breathe. And suddenly, I started to feel that I will lose my conscience. I must add that till that point, I was constantly thinking bad about myself. I was blaming myself for starting to cry, that it developed in that way. I was blaming myself that when my parents, who are not Adventists, uh, they see my condition, they would blame the church for it, and I would not be even able to say it is my fault. But at that point, I started to feel that soon I will lost my consciousness. And it was the time when I finally was able to turn to Jesus, asking for help. First in my mind, Jesus, help me, please. Jesus, help me, please. I was only constantly repeating this one sentence in my mind. And my body started immediately to get warmer and warmer. And I was able to speak aloud. So at loud I kept asking, Jesus, please help me. Jesus, please help me. And quickly, but gradually, I was able to move all my members, and my heart was filled with joy and gratitude to Jesus. I was able to experience His power again. What I want to highlight, sharing with you that experience, is that it did not come from Satanism or any of those things. It came from cherishing thoughts planted by the realm of darkness. It came by, by not resisting the power of darkness in the power of Jesus. And then I learned the lesson that we are not secure from the kingdom of darkness if we do not submit continually to Jesus, even in our thoughts. We need to assess them and renounce all that are not from him. And of course, we are not able to do this on our own, in our own strength. So that's why we need to come to Jesus and experience that he is always more powerful than the kingdom of Satan. And from that time, I learned how to fight that battle. And speaking of which, 
Let me also point to you that when Apostle Paul speaks of our methods of fighting with the kingdom of darkness in the letter to Ephesians, chapter 6, he doesn't speak about exorcisms, incantations, or, or anything of that sort. He speaks of prayer, faith, salvation, righteousness, the word of God, and preaching of the gospel. Those are the methods. Those are the methods by which God can empower us to be able to stand in this war. When we give ourselves daily to Jesus, our Messiah, our heart is regenerated and secured from Satan. We learn how to rest in the perfect assurance of salvation. And then we learn from him what to think, how to behave, how to maintain the relationship with him through prayer and study of the, his word. We are also called by him to be active members to participate in his efforts to advance his kingdom. So to conclude, dear friends, I would like to thank Pastor Castrati who challenged me with this topic. This topic which probably I would not choose for myself for today. But we need to listen to the voice of Jesus. Not only when he speaks that he loves us, not only when he teaches us the golden rule, rule to treat others as we would like to be treated by them, not only the words of great commission, but also what Jesus has to say about the battle between his kingdom and the kingdom of darkness. And today we learned about those two kingdoms, following things. First, Jesus is always more powerful than the kingdom of darkness. Secondly, we cannot be neutral in that war. And thirdly, we are not secure from Satan if we are not constantly surrendered to God's kingdom. I would like to challenge you at the end of this sermon to submit to Jesus, to resist the temptation to stay neutral in this war and constantly maintain relationship with Jesus so that he can speak to you, unmask the snares of Satan and protect you from the evil one. God bless you.